In this paper, I want to take you on a walk through a garden. It is, to be sure, an imaginary garden, but it has trees, vines, fruits, fences and fountains, and I want to pay close attention to them. But I think the garden has a significance which extends beyond itself. And some of this significance concerns words and texts. For as we shall see, the garden is, amongst other things, a garden of rhetoric. The garden, as I'm sure you've guessed, is in Gregory of Nyssa's homilies on the Song of Songs, which, for obvious reasons, have mostly been studied from the perspective of the doctrine of the soul's ascent to God, his apophatic theology, and his biblical hermeneutics. However, today, instead of pressing ahead to the spiritual interpretation, I would like us to pause and wander a little through the landscape and the garden, which is vividly described by the song itself and then reiterated um, lavishly by Gregory himself. Why do I think that this is important? This is an example of Gregory's use of rhetoric, and generally speaking, I don't think that rhetoric is ever just rhetoric. More specifically, those aspects of the writings of the Church Fathers, which some previous scholars have taught us to think of as mere rhetorical flourishes, perhaps mere decoration or opportune nods of the head to classical culture, all of these aspects, I would argue, are more significant than they might at first appear. Still more specifically, gardens, because they are human creations, tell us something about their creators. Gardening, argues one gardening historian, has little to do with the history of art or the development of aesthetic theories. It is all about social aspirations, lifestyles, money and class. We can therefore read a garden like a text, as the British anthropologist Kate Fox has done so amusingly in her book, Watching the English. And if you want to understand the mysteries of my nation, I highly recommend it. She says, the English all want to live in their own private box with their own private green bit. Our moats and drawbridges may be imaginary, but every Englishman's castle has its miniature grounds. But precisely because gardens can be read in this way, what is said and written about them takes on significance. The words reveal something about the values and the aspirations of the gardener, but also of her observer. Thus, according to Fox, um, she uses the social scientific categories that I'm going to use, a lower class garden might well be treasured by its owner for being colourful, cheerful, neat and tidy, but condemned by middle class next door neighbours for being garish and regimented. Now, I may seem to be wandering way beyond the garden wall here, if not leaving you up the garden path, so let me rapidly return to the ancient world. As Richard Jenkins points out so eloquently in his book, Virgil's Experience, the ancients' attitude to landscape revealed much about their social values. He writes, Where is the landscape garden, which most Englishmen, and some others, believe to be the highest form of garden art yet devised, affects to mimic the spontaneity and asymmetry of uncultivated nature. The ancient garden tames and regularises it. Typically, it is symmetrical and enclosed, and it is useful for growing fruits and vegetables. Gardens, therefore, in the ancient world represent nature tamed, and even when authors write about a landscape, which is not, strictly speaking, a garden, it still has many garden-like features mild and gentle scenes, cultivated ground, tilth and vineyard, or a mixture of spring, meadow, and shady grove. This contrasts with a hostile landscape which is full of high mountains, snow-capped peaks, and torrents precipitously hurling themselves towards the sea. And of course, these ancient depictions of ideal landscape emerge from a social reality in which agriculture was precarious, Life in the countryside was threatened by dangers from weather, beasts and bandits, 
and life in cities was increasingly crowded. The ancients then shared an assumption that a pleasant landscape was fertile, tended and moderately populated and ancient writers drew on this shared assumption in various ways. First, they used landscape to evoke mood. Descriptions of wild mountains evoke a sense of fear or perhaps of awe because only a god can dwell there. Descriptions of milder landscapes, however, evoke pleasure perhaps a pride in civilization and the value of hard work. In love lyric, they can evoke the awakening or the satisfaction of desire. Pleasant landscapes are above all attractive, and I mean that in a fairly literal way. They draw to them both humans and gods. So in the Homeric hymns, Persephone was lured to the entrance of Hades while she was gathering flowers over a soft meadow roses and crocuses and beautiful violets, irises, hyacinths and the narcissus. Even Pan is lured back at night by soft streams and hyacinths and crocuses in the meadow. Indeed, Sappho uses precisely this idea of attractive landscape to call Aphrodite to her, and this is the poem on the handout. Come, goddess, to your holy shrine where your delightful apple grove awaits and altars smoke with frankincense. A cool brook sounds through apple boughs and alls with roses overhung from shimmering leaves a trance-like sleep takes hold. Here's a flowery meadow too where horses graze and gentle blow the breezes. Here then, love goddess much in mind, infuse our feast in gracious style with nectar poured in cups that turn to gold. Richard Jenkins comments on the way in which one finds in this poem, perhaps for the first time in Greek literature, to quote, the combination of personal emotion or experience with the description or evocation of the individual character of the scene. The poem conveys both a mood and a picture, both subjectivity and objectivity, as Sappho conveys how she feels being in a particular place at a particular time. In Jenkins' words, the poem expresses an enhanced feeling for nature coming into association with the divine. Her expectation is appropriate because in Greek poetry, when a god enters a landscape, he or she changes it. So in the Iliad, for example, the sea rejoices when Poseidon drives in his chariot over the waves. The earth blossoms with extravagant and out-of-season flowers under the, under the coupling of Zeus and Hera. Besides using landscape to evoke mood, classical poets used descriptions of landscape to heighten or emphasise a sense of someone's character. Most famously is the example from Odyssey 7 of Alcinous's garden. It is orderly enclosed and extraordinarily fruitful with pears, pomegranates, apples, figs, olives and vines. It thus fits and heightens our sense of who Alcinous is, a king in charge of an orderly society. Even though the fertility of his garden is frankly magical, it is so because of the god's favour to him. Jenkins argues that the places where Circe, Calypso and Nausicaa live all have a similar kind of significance in the Odyssey. It's not, it's not that their locations are allegories of their respective characters. Rather, the fact that Nausicaa lives in a gentle meadow and Calypso in a remote, wild, yet fertile island says something about the women they are. There's a fit between character and context. This was taken a step further in the Roman Republic and also in early Augustan literature in which farming, um, I have to say, albeit of a fairly gentle kind, was deemed an appropriate activity for the wise man and a garden was the location for philosophical debate as opposed to the idle chatter of city dinner parties. Conversely, one finds in this literature condemnation of an excessive garden for the features which were intended solely for impressive display rather than productive of food or philosophy. 
So Horace, for example, condemns vast estates with huge fish ponds and gardens given over to ornamental trees and flowers rather than growing wheat. In such writing, then, landscape, farms and gardens are endowed with a moral significance which reflects back <coughs> on their owners. Thirdly, the increasingly elaborate description of tended landscapes led writers in the empire to use such descriptions as a space in which to ponder the art of writing itself. The reason for this is obvious. The composition of texts, like gardening, is a combination of nature and nurture. Too much artifice and the effect will seem ostentatious or plain ugly. Too little and it will be wild and disorganised and will not produce its intended fruits. I think we all know about the discipline of pruning when we're writing. An excellent example of this rhetorical theme appears in Themistius's funeral oration in honour of his father, which is also on your handout. To begin with, agriculture appears in this oration merely as a suitable activity for a philosopher. My father, Themistius says, praised agriculture highly and loved it. He declared that in agriculture one could find the only kind of rest suitable for a philosopher, the kind that comes after hard work. Next, Themistius artfully uses a reference to the Odyssey to comment on the perfect fit between his father's cultivated and fruitful garden and his soul, which was well-ordered and not full of rustic crudeness, agroikias. Finally, Themistius draws a connection between gardening and rhetoric. Nor could you have made any comparison of even a brief remark or admonition of his to the fruit that grew without interruption for Alcinous or to the golden apples of the Hesperides. For my father's intention was not to achieve beauty alone in his words. He said that those who, in working the soil, plant only groves of lush plane trees and cypresses and have no interest in wheat and grapevines, aim more at enjoyment than at nourishment. He used to compare such tree planters to those who in their discourse are in search only of pleasure and of how to charm their audience, but neither know how nor even try to speak of the things from which the soul derives nourishment and by which it is bettered. Such men, he would say, are not yet philosophers any more than those tree planters are farmers. They are flatterers, fauners and cooks instead of physicians. They are beautifiers instead of athletic trainers. As you can see, this is highly artful writing. He begins with a reference to Alcinous' garden and concludes with Plato's famous contrast between the sophist and the philosopher in Gorgias. He's developing a theme of which he was particularly fond, that philosophy and rhetoric need each other. So the well-ordered, carefully irrigated garden is doubly appropriate to his father. Like Alcinous' garden, it fits the character of his soul, but it also reflects the way in which that character had its expression in words. There is also a sense of the excessive garden. As we saw in um, Horace, excessive artifice was connected with a failure to be productive or useful. So what has all this got to do with Gregory's homilies on the song? <coughs> Firstly, and despite um, an acute awareness of all the words that have been written on it, I think we still need to make an effort to recapture a sense of what it might have been like for Gregory to read it. It is all too easy for us to read the song through the lens of a long Western tradition of spiritual interpretation or with modern historical critiques designed to illuminate its original genre and composition. But Gregory, of course, had neither the benefit of historical criticism nor of the Western mystical tradition. I suggest then that when he read the Song of Songs, its poetic subjects would have been very familiar to him from his own literary traditions. Shepherds, spring flowers, gentle bird song, vines and vineyards, figs and other fruits, are all ingredients of the classic mild and pleasant landscape. For us today, these images now perhaps recall 
the song itself, origin, Gregory, perhaps Bernard. For Gregory, they were likely to recall Homer, Sappho, and Theocritus. In what remains of my paper, I'd like to explain why I think this is important and what it has to do with rhetoric. And in order to do this, I would like to look at one passage in particular, a section of Gregory's fifth homily in which he comments on song chapter 2, verse 11, for behold, the winter is past. I will pay very little attention to Gregory's spiritual interpretation of these words. Instead, I will focus on the way in which he dwells, and he dwells on the description of the landscape and garden, commenting on its physical features and even expanding the description himself. Why, if he thinks that the truth of the song lies in its spiritual meaning, and he does say that, does he spend so much time writing about gardens? Before I examine the homily, however, I want very briefly to offer for sceptics some corroborating evidence that Gregory's writing about gardens was on occasion self-consciously referring to the classical and rhetorical traditions that I have outlined above. An excellent example, of course, is his letter 20 to Adelphius, which refers both by name and through other verbal echoes to Odyssey 7's description of the gardens of King Alcinous. Like Alcinous's garden, Adelphius's is well-ordered, beautiful and fecund. It may not bear magical fruit through the supernatural intervention of the gods, but it does contain peaches grown through the crafty mixing of different strains. Gregory self-consciously draws attention to the way in which the garden is nature tamed by art, techne. Ironically, the ordered planting is so artistic, it is impossible for the art of worlds to describe. Gregory later draws attention to the way in which even the fish in the ponds are tame beyond all expectation. <coughs> We are to assume then, just as Alcinous's garden heightens our sense of him as the rich king of an orderly society, so Gregory's words flatteringly reflect on Adelphius's wealth and his good management of the estate. Gregory is perhaps also implicitly comparing the physical beauty and order to the virtues of his inner life. But we may also note some tension. If nature is tyrannised by art, as Gregory says, is there a somewhat tasteless excess in this garden? This might particularly seem to be the case in the light of a tirade against luxurious gardens in the third of Gregory's homilies on Ecclesiastes. It is true that this tirade is set within an allegorical interpretation, but as Gregory progresses, his words seem to become detached from that interpretation and to become an attack on real luxurious gardens. Art, in those cases, is guilty of distorting nature, exceeding plain need, under the influence of undisciplined desire. So from these and other passages in Gregory's writings, I think we can draw the following conclusions. He does sometimes self-consciously draw on other classic descriptions of gardens in his own writing. It's likely he's using a description of a garden in letter 20 to heighten our sense of Adelphius's character without in any way suggesting that the garden is not real. So again, this is not an allegory. Thirdly, he is able to use the nature-artifice relationship to create a sense of wonder and to condemn the kind of artifice that arises from unbridled desire for luxury. And finally, in letter 20, he artfully and very disingenuously contrasts the art of the gardener with his own claimed lack of ver verbal skill. Yeah, Gregory. <laughs> So he's using a description of a garden as a location in which to reflect on the art of writing. So now finally, let us turn to the fifth homily on the songs. And on the handout, I've given you the quotation of the verses from the song itself and then Gregory's expansion of them in his own words. As Gregory notes... The words in the song itself, um, beginning for behold the winter is past, 
are the bride's account of what the groom said, so they're reported speech. Gregory himself then expands on these words and explains the meaning of the passage through allegorical <coughs> interpretation. The winter signifies the time when humanity was frozen stiff by idolatry and the spring denotes humanity's salvation through the spirit and the word. The question for me then is why does Gregory expand on the bride's words in so much detail? Why not just stick with the allegorical interpretation? I think it's because he's reading the song as if he was reading Greek literature. He thinks that the song evokes um, the mood of the bride, the character of the lover, the divine word, and I think he also uses this passage as a location in which to think about the art of writing and inspiration. Throughout all of this, there is a blurring between what we might call the literal meaning of the poem and his theological interpretation. Gregory constantly and confusingly slides between references to the bride, henumphe, and the soul, hesuche. Quite often he uses no noun at all and simply relies on feminine participles of the verb, exploiting Greek's ambivalence. As we will see, there's a similar blurring of the way in which he refers to the word, which could mean the divine word or uh, the word of the biblical text. I suggest here that Gregory's expansion of the literal scene of the landscape in the text never ceases to be a description of the landscape, but it is a description which carries with it a cultural significance which would have been appreciated by his audience. So in this particular place, there is no replacement meaning to be decoded through allegory. There is a mood to be felt. So what is this mood then? Gregory emphasises the bride's anticipation, which causes her both desire and grief. Her report suggests a fittingness between the groom's arrival and the season, for the passage contains many of the features of pleasant landscape that we noted above pastures, flowers, fruit, and softly singing birds. To the classical Greek mind, this simply is the appropriate context for a romantic encounter. But as in Sappho's fragment too, the erotic spills over into the religious. For in Gregory's expansion of the text, he makes it clear that it is not merely appropriate for the lover to be in that pleasant place, but that the lover's arrival makes the landscape pleasant because he is divine. He is the maker of springtime. It is as if Gregory read the references to the groom in the poem leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills, in the light of Homeric images of gods entering a landscape and bringing the transformation of nature in their wake. Although it is true we are talking about the divine word, not a human groom here, Nevertheless, we are still talking about literal flowers, fruit, and birds. Now, I'm not necessarily claiming that Gregory was drawing directly here from Homer or Sappho. I am suggesting that he was reading the song in the light of that general tradition, and that he uses his expansion of the words of the song to heighten the bride's mood of desire and awe. The word, which is both the word of the text and the divine word, not only describes these emotions in the bride, but causes the reader as well to share them. Gregory's comments also draw attention to the way in which uh, the song delineates the character of the groom. And Gregory's expansion of the words of the song heightens the sense of the beauty of spring, thus glorifying the maker of springtime still further. The order and fruitfulness of this landscape and garden reflect back on its maker, the divine word. Elsewhere in the song, we are constantly reminded that the garden is his garden. My beloved has gone down to his garden to feed his flocks, for example. Furthermore, both groom and bride are compared in the song with gardens. So Gregory seems to read this passage with an understanding that in a literary context, characters can be placed in a landscape which is fitting to their character. Thirdly, this passage, I think, enables Gregory to say something not just about the creative power of the word in nature, but about the nature of discourse. 
and specifically divine or inspired discourse. To understand this, we need to take a closer look at precisely how Gregory expands the description of spring. The emphatic repetition of lege and the use of hupographe at the beginning and the end of the passage implies that verses 11 to 13 are a speech with certain intentional features. Gregory also comments on the style of the speech. At the beginning, he says it is done elegantly, glafurose. At the end, he sums up its contents as being these elegant things, tone glafurone to tone. We will return to this word in a minute. Furthermore, Gregory implicitly draws attention to the fact that the description of spring appeals to all of the senses, which is a very common rhetorical method. His um, riff on the song emphasises that it evokes the sight of the meadows teeming and glorious with blossoms, the sound of the birds and the fragrance of flowers. It even alludes to the anticipated taste of the ripening fig and vine and imagines the touch of those picking flowers and plaiting them into wreaths. Finally, Gregory draws on the ambiguity of hologos in a way which is impossible to convey in English. Not only does it mean the divine word in the word of the text, but it could also be taken simply to mean a speech. A Greek audience could hear Gregory saying, this speech embellishes the season with the songs of the birds in the groves. This speech waxes lyrical in its account. The words he uses here, Hedune and Abruno, seem to me to draw attention to the artfulness of your speech and, in fact, occur commonly in literary criticism. With this vocabulary, then, Gregory is telling us that he regards the words of the divine word as an example of an artful description, an ekphrasis. As he gives his own literary critical appreciation, he expands on the passage with elaborate phrasing and beautiful images in order to press home the point. But is there anything um, theologically significant behind this? Is this Gregory just getting carried away with himself? I think there are two reasons, one explicit and one implicit. Gregory's explicit reason for stressing the artfulness of these verses is expressed most clearly by the conclusion to his own ekphrasis of spring. The word, he says, thus speaks with elegance in its account of springtime's beauty, both casting out gloom and dwelling fondly upon accounts of things that afford more pleasure. It is best, though, I think, that our understanding not come to rest in the account of these sweet things, but rather journey by their help towards the mysteries that these oracles reveal, so that the treasure of the ideas hidden in the words may be brought to light. This passage elegantly expresses an idea familiar to us from Origen and other passages in Gregory. God uses sweet words about beautiful things as a pedagogical device in order to attract the soul to a deeper message. As we've seen, it also echoes Themistius' idea that the best speech does not achieve beauty alone. The best speech does not just seek to give pleasure and charm its audience. However, there's a second reason, I think, which is implicit, which would have been picked up by the more educated members of his audience. This further implicit reason is to be found in his use of certain terms like glafuros, which have a semi-technical or rhetorical meaning. The adjective glafuros comes from the verb glafo to scrape or hollow out and was the standard Homeric epithet for a ship. When applied to things made by hand, it came to mean polished, smooth, neat or delicate. And when applied to the works of the mind, it was used to mean subtle, exact, skillful or refined. In other words, it was a word used to um, denote a high degree of craftsmanship, something, I think, which the English word elegant um, does not really capture. Eventually, the term glafuros was applied in a specifically literary context to describe a polished and refined style, usually, but not always, to commend it. One important example of this is the treatise on style, commonly attributed to an otherwise unknown Demetrius, 
and dating probably from the 2nd century BCE, although that's contested. Demetrius argues that there are four literary styles. The grand one, megaloprepes, is complex and weighty. The plain is simple and light. It's iskunus. There are two intermediate styles, the forceful denos, which is weighty but quite simple in structure, and the elegant or refined style, glapuros, which is light but quite complex in structure. The glapuros style, he tells us, is witty and cheerful. It sometimes tends in the direction of outright comedy. At other times, in the hands of lyric poets, it is more dignified and characterised above all by charm, by charis. And this is a word to which Demetrius frequently returns. While the comic glaphoros style aims to make us laugh, the writer of the lyric glaphoros style aims to give pleasure. Demetrius regards the lyric poetry as a sophisticated kind of glaphoros style and analyses in some detail which kinds of composition and diction lend themselves to it. He also delineates the style's appropriate subject matter, gardens of the nymphs, marriage songs, loves, or the poetry of Sappho generally. Indeed, he returns repeatedly to Sappho as his archetypal poet of charm, praising her because, in words which are themselves beautiful and attractive, she sings of beauty or love or spring or the halcyon. Now, theories of style in late antiquity are complex and very difficult to generalise. Um, Christoph Kloch has a very nice expression. He says that this realm of language is technical but imprecise, which I think captures the difficulty very nicely. However, my research suggests that there was a fairly constant use of some terminology associated with specific styles. And glaphoros, in particular, denoted this style associated with lyric verse, some kinds of comedy, with Isocratean rhetoric, the philosophy of Plato, and in speeches with the encomium. Its ability to charm and delight was appropriate, both when the matter of the um, content was love and when it was philosophy. This style has often been labelled in English the middle style because it was sometimes set between an austere plain style and a magnificent sublime one. But we should be cautious about this middle placing. The middle style supposedly intermediate position allowed for a certain amount of creative positioning versus the other two. Advocates could argue that their style was plain compared to their um, opponent's over-elaborateness, or, on another occasion, could say that it was carefully worked and sophisticated compared to other opponents' dry archaism. I think it's fair to say that this rhetorical manipulation of ancient theories of style has often been missed and has led to much scholarly confusion. We must be wary, then, and expect Gregory's own use of the landscape theme to bear the marks of his own rhetorical manipulation. With this in mind, what conclusions do I draw then from my wander through the landscape of Gregory's fifth homily on the song? Gregory of Nyssa is telling his audience that at least part of the song is written in a style which is elegant. Furthermore, the subjects of the song include gardens, a bride, a marriage song and love, precisely the subjects which Demetrius picks out as typical of the Glaphoros style and, of course, we know that in Greek, the word for bride and nymph is very similar. Greek, um, Gregory repeatedly remarks that various speeches in the song are encomia. This word occurs again and again and again in the text. And we just heard that the word glaphoros and that style is appropriate to the encomium. The vocabulary Gregory uses here is surely pointed. It's a kind of rhetoric about rhetoric, if you like. Some pagans argued that the Bible could not be treated seriously because it was not high literature. Now, other scholars before me have pointed out that various church fathers try to argue that certain portions of the Old Testament were poetic, even that they were written in metre. 
But here, I think, we have a church father going much further than that general point. Firstly, Gregory is very specific about the style. It is not simply a case of plain versus sophisticated. This is a particular style applied appropriately and well to a particular subject matter. Secondly, not only is Gregory arguing that the song is beautiful, finely crafted, and very far from plain, but he is also clearly imitating the song's own style in his extended variations on the landscape theme. By implication, he is laying claim to be creating an elegant text himself. This matters because Gregory doesn't just read the song then with an eye to its literal meaning and how that can be decoded through allegorical interpretation. He also reads it like a student of literature or a pupil of a rhetorical teacher who then goes to seek to imitate its style himself. This gives the text of Gregory's commentary a very important role. Whereas the bride imitates the groom in receiving the teachings he gives her and teaching them to her companions. Gregory, on the other hand, imitates the divine word, the inspire of scripture, by imitating not just the content, but also the mode of divine discourse. I suggest then that Gregory, with his appreciation of the words of the song and his own very beautiful descriptions of landscape, is struggling towards an appreciation of language as expressive of beauty. It evokes, as we have seen, the character of God as supremely beautiful. Furthermore, this language is affective. It not only describes, but also creates in its audience a desire for the word. Resting on poetic and rhetorical conventions, Gregory read the descriptions of landscape in the song as evoking mood and character, and he sought to replicate this in his own writing. He also, as I've tried to show, used the descriptions of gardens in the song as a location for reflection on the nature of divinely inspired human language, both the language of scripture and his own words. This language produces texts which bring charm, pleasure, and the awakening of desire. Therefore, for Gregory, whatever we might say about his interpretation of the bride and the groom in the song, even though the Song of Songs for him was perhaps not about the joy of sex, it was at least partly about the joy of text. Thank you.